everyone. Thank you for coming to the Science and Media Lecture Series. Today we are hosting Ethan Carlstein. Ethan uh, received his PhD from Harvard in molecular and cell biology. And then he went on to become a postdoc at Princeton University and is now an independent scientist who was able to raise $25,000 through a crowdfunding campaign to uh, fund his project on learning a life or how methamphetamines work in the brain. So today he's going to tell us about his experiences and um, some tips about how to crowdfund yourself. So thanks, Ethan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. So today I'm going to divulge a super secret formula for crowdfunding. It's just to be really simple. Here's the formula right there. Essentially, what my entire talk is going to boil down to is this equation. So the first component to a successful crowdfunding campaign is appealing to your social networks. You add that with uh, appealing to the world around you, and you can't do that yourself. Usually, your microphone isn't big enough, so you have to use help with media outlets, or bloggers, and other people who are in social media. So social networks and strangers and a lot of hustle, that's sort of the X factor there. And that can get you to around $25,000. So as Jeannie said, my lab for five years was interested um, in an area that we come to call evolutionary pharmacology. And the idea there is that we want to use simple model organisms like these cells to study the mechanism of complex drugs. Uh, my interest is in CNS, so brain disease, and central disease of the central nervous system. So we use yeast to study antidepressants. And that seems a little counterintuitive because we think, well, yeast don't get depressed, they don't have brains, they're even cellular, why would you give antidepressants? Uh, well, it turns out, I think over the last five years, we've discovered uh, a lot of what I would call dark matter mechanisms of action of these drugs. In other words, activities that molecules like Zoloft, for example, have uh, that uh, are not just simply linked with serotonin. So my lab did that for many years, uh, but it was only a five-year uh, commitment. And so after that period of time, my, my budget was going to dry up, and I was I was done. I had not in your track nominal position. So sort of with my back up against the wall scientifically and thinking, where am I going to get resources and funding? Uh, I sort of became a little desperate, and I had a choice. So I went to break good or break bad. And this. Uh, it's important because in the end, he chose to study, as uh, Gene said, the mechanism of action of amphetamines, including the notorious crystal meth, uh, which is the subject of the show, Brain Bad, which I'm sure next time you can saw these numbers, and the last of the animals. So we had a choice similar to the protagonist uh, uh, of the show of what, what are you going to do uh, when, when up against sort of the wall? And again, I wasn't going to resort to making crystal meth. We decided instead to crowdfund uh, a meth lab, a research lab. So I'm going to tell you a story about how we actually were able to raise, in the end, $25,460. So this is the team. It's me in the middle there. The lead project experimentalist is Danny Krasichevsky. And all of these are experiments are hosted uh, by Professor David Solzer at Columbia University Medical Center, whose lab studies amphetamines and has studied amphetamines for, for over 20 years. We had to brand our campaign, so this was uh, a logo we had commissioned by our uh, chief sort of creative designer, Ryan Griffin, who also made it in the video. I'm going to show you in a minute. Like any good campaign, we had a launch party, we had a rally, so to speak, uh, in October, uh, where we had laptops set up and where we screened our project video and where we had people donate and helped us really get off uh, to a really great start. And of course, I made tons of business cards with this QR code and came to the donation page and handed them out to any person who would listen to me. So now I want to show you our three minute project video. Oops. It's time to experiment with the way we experiment. We will use the internet to allow the public to fund and participate in a fully crowdsourced basic research project. The internet, that some of the fruit of curiosity driven research, has transformed every creative endeavor in this time to promote collaboration, openness, and efficiency. And scientists are stuck in a closed, critical mindset. We need to change that. So who are we, in my view, is Ethan Hosting's lab at Princeton has been developing a new evolutionary approach to studying how drugs work. For nearly two decades, David Solzer's lab at Columbia Med School 
and we'll need to consider the contracts to the break. Our labs now join forces to tackle a long standing puzzle in mental health research. How does the family of drugs called amphetamine, which increase methamphetamine, actually work? Millions of people take these drugs every day, yet we don't fully really understand what they do for some of the level. How can we hope to make treatments to brain diseases or addiction without basic understanding? It's simple. We can't. We will use a proven technique called autoradiography to figure out where these drugs go in the brain. Decades ago, this approach famously demonstrated that the psychedelic drug LSD works by interacting with specific neurotransmitter receptors throughout the brain. Autoradiography is really just radioactive photography. We'll start by injecting into a sample a radioactive version of the drug, which acts like a tiny little beacon. Then, we'll expose radiation to film. The radioactive emission appears dark spots for dealing with drugs' precise locations. By combining autoradiography with a powerful microscope, we will appear deep inside brain cells to resolve once and for all where amphetamine is accumulated. The best part is, we don't know where it will end up, so the public will experience the feeling of discovery as it occurs. But to change the culture of science, we need your support and your input. To bring you closer to the action, we will make all data we generate freely available on the web. We will provide legally blog and video reports detailing how research is progressing on the project website. We will also hold regular online meetings to discuss results as they trickle in. And for the most generous supporters, we will offer the opportunity to engage in brainstorm sessions to help us make any scholarly publications resulting from this project intelligible to non scientists. The light bulb wasn't invented by someone improving the candle. Together, we can create an open model of scientific research and communication for the internet age and beyond. So this video was made by an amazing team led by the director Ryan Griffin, voice over was by Monica Maya, and the music was uniquely scored by Alan Steinman. So this is what we found when we came to our crowdfunding donation page on the Rocket Up website, which is one of the big uh, sort of generic crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, like Indiegogo. So this is the figure I like to start out with because it summarizes in one one fell swoop what what it looked like to run a 50 day to we were asking for $25,000 uh, for a basic biomedical research project where we had perks, but the perks were sort of more, A, come interact with the scientists on Skype or Google Plus. We, we, we did give away a 3D printed methamphetamine molecule, which I can show you at the end. But other than that, we were sort of offering people the experience of the thrill of discovery. And so that in itself was a big experiment as to whether that would actually work as, a, as an idea. So in a 52 day campaign, this is what it looks like if you plot each day's numbers. So I put this as a reference here, this, this line, which suggests this is, this is the constant growth. So if you were to raise $480 a day approximately, you could get to $25,000 in exactly 52 days, right? So that's sort of your imagining your head behind you. But that's, the reality is, is messier. That's, that's not really how fundraising campaigns work, even in the sort of real world. You have an NPR campaign on sort of work. You get a bunch of people at the beginning who are really into it. They do it. Everyone else procrastinates, and then everyone's like, oh, no, I've got two hours left. So essentially, we recapitulated those kinds of things. So at the very beginning, for that first week, we were able to establish a down payment on the project. And boom, that was several thousand dollars. And that was assisted by some media coverage. So I mentioned before that we were able not just to appeal sort of relentlessly and incessantly to our, uh, our family, friends, and followers through social media. We also had to get other people we didn't know interested in the campaign. And all of these uh, write-ups actually were a tremendous boost in terms of traffic and ultimately uh, on the followers. So in that first, right out of the gate, we had coverage in a uh, fairly famous blog called In the Pipeline, which blogs about the pharmaceutical industry and drugs. We had a, a blog post on Scientific American, uh, as well as a blog post on, on Wired. And that really helped us establish a down payment again. And that very crucial kind of first uh, stretch of the campaign. So that established our viability. And then we began this long, slow ascent uh, to this base camp here, which was then looking at this summit, which was, in the end, we actually had to raise $5,000 to get to our goal. But again, 80% of the campaign, in terms of the time, was the slow, steady ascent. And there were periods there where we were kind of flag and taper off. Uh, we always had at least one donor. Uh, day. We never had a day where we had zero donors, although that involved some amount of harm twisting in some days, um, virtually mostly. Uh, but then we had these periods where we get covered throughout the campaign. So we had a piece come up on, on Mashable, uh, he appeared to be a economist, 
Now, the show didn't seem, despite the names and maybe the, the variety of these alloys, that didn't seem to just instantly guarantee success. I think actually what that did is also add to the sense of viability of this campaign that ultimately we would, uh, we would make it. But you see, we did below this ideal line, uh, sort of pathway to the campaign, where we realized, okay, we're going to have to make up a lot of ground. But these, this, this sort of shape here is what sometimes, sometimes referred to as a U-shaped campaign. You have most of the donating, most of the fundraising is happening at sort of the beginning and at the end. And the middle is just sort of treading water, but, but gradually just keep moving, just keep moving. So how does that sort of compare to other campaigns? So if you look, uh, many of these crowdfunding sites like, like uh, Indiegogo, for example, maintain a blog where they share statistics and data about the campaigns. So they calculated uh, this kind of graph where you see that how much of the goal was, was achieved in the beginning, so basically the first 10% of your campaign, so our case would be like the first week, how much was in those intervening weeks, and then at the very end, how much did you make up? And you can see here that the beginning and the end play this crucial role. And so we found if you stack up our campaign, we had a comparable uh, surge in the beginning. We, we flagged that we weren't quite up to the average according to Indiegogo, but this, again, Indiegogo includes lots of other projects that are not scientific, so it's not a totally perfect comparison, I suppose. But suggests that we had to make up a lot more ground in the end, but we were actually able to. Now, this is to give you a sense of what the campaign looks like really in the nuts and bolts. Each of these circles here represents one of the 52 days of the campaign. And on this uh, uh, plot here are how many contributors that we had per day. So, right here, the, the, we had, again, we had no days where we had no contributors, but we had several days where we had only one contributor. The number of days where we only had two contributors, three contributors, and so on. Of course, there was this outlier here, and that was the last day, which I'll talk about today. You can see the same uh, pattern when you look at the total amount of contributions of dollars per day. So again, most days consist of making, bringing in maybe $100, $200, some days only $25. Uh, but then there was a day where we made over $5,000. That was our, again, closing day. Is that the sombrero function? The sombrero function, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> And so here's that, here's now zooming in, uh, now hour by hour granularity, what that last day looked like. So if you start the countdown, sorry, with 24 hours left, and you ask how much money was being raised per hour, we had a point where that afternoon before the end of the campaign, we, we had our, one of our best hours, over $1,000. That included uh, some angels, individuals who gave the $500 chunks, which was actually a surprise. These were people that we didn't know who were uh, solicited essentially on Twitter. That looks really cool because some days we were, like I said, you know, some days we only had $25 the entire day. Uh, and here we're having uh, this amazing surge take us, take us to the end. Now to give you a sense of uh, the, the grandeur of that, the average donation, if you calculate how much was given over how many people actually donated, that's about $64, which is on the lower end of what people in the industry say crowdfunding campaign should be at, somewhere in the seventy to hundred dollars range, which is consistent. Crowdfunding standards. We were a little bit below that, but our median was twenty-five dollars, which was uh, consistent with other campaigns, suggesting the reason why these don't match is that you, you only have a few people who are giving in a really high amount that are sort of skewing things. But the majority of people, the majority of donors, are actually giving in small chunks. And again, this per the three three men that I mean, what's the twenty-five dollars per? Can I can I ask a question now yeah. or uh, yeah, questions um, at any time? Okay, um, so this you I see. 16 hours after midnight, that would be 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, is that what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah. Um, why do you think that 4 p.m. is so significant? I don't think so there was anything about that, actually. It was this hour where I think we had one or maybe even both of our $500 angels kind of just swoop in. Okay. people that I had tweeted at, cold tweeted at, like, sometime during the campaign, so maybe even days or not weeks before that. And it just happened to sort of see this thing that I tweeted at the campaign. Yeah. Were they were they from? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, are they from the, the Eastern time zone or? Yeah, one is a New Yorker, but I think the other was not a New Yorker actually. Okay. Europe. Uh, it's just an indicator, I think, of the social media kind of metrics. And yeah, I mean, I think that was kind of a fluke of that stretch here. This was these were these were sort of a more. I mean, there was a period that we were getting uh, this this sort of this little misleading because there were points. Getting a donation literally every five minutes. And I know because I'm going to go off the email saying, hey, you just got a donation. So there, were, there was a period starting actually around in the evening when sure. my phone just didn't shut up because it was just email, email, 
really extreme. And this is, and also again, this is all catalyzed by Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, just following up from that, what was your geographical distribution is in, within the United States and the living overseas donors? Yeah. What does that look like when they're mainly like New York based? So I have a slide where I talk about demographics because we survey things, so I'll get to you in that area. Remind me by by so this, though, just seems impressive. Maybe perhaps maybe this thousand dollars an hour seems like a big deal, but it turns out that in the, the non-science crowdfunding space, so crowdfunding is more popular, uh, our numbers are chump change, literally chump change, and our rates are literally to lack that. So, but again, these these represent to some extent outliers, but they tell you what the potential is with this kind of crowdfunding, just the kind of mechanism of raising funds. So the oatmeal was a campaign that was run by a web comic calls themselves the old email, some people shake their head. They, they raised that, they, they were looking to, what the campaign was called was uh, fun, crowd, crowd fun, let's say the goddamn test music, something like this, I'm paraphrasing, but it did have a goddamn test. And so the idea was that there was this property that Nikola Tesla owned in New York, and it was you know, going to be seized or something, and they needed to raise this money to basically save it. Um, they were going to get a partner who was going to match them, and they needed $875,000. And they were at one point of a campaign that raised $27,000. So that's, that was our campaign in an hour, in two days of an hour. Then, you know, another webcomic, for some reason the webcomics, I think it's because they have a really fan, loyal, rabid fan base that you knows how to use social media, but a Saturday morning breakfast, there was another webcomic who was, who was crowdfunding up, basically up on our own art project, and, and their first day on Kickstarter raised 70k. And then more recently, I don't know if there are any fans of Veronica Mars here, but that campaign, the Veronica Mars movie, launched on Kickstarter uh, uh, earlier this month, and Raised two million dollars in ten hours, so fifty dollars a second, which is pretty pretty amazing when you think about it. And that's from fifty thousand donors. So you're getting lots of people giving less than two hundred dollars, not just a few kind of people just knowing this. I mean, just knowing that it, this was a real, it really was a crowd. So this is that just to give you a sense of what's possible with this mechanism. Science, I don't know if the scientists are going to do this anytime soon, but if the arts and the other creatives who have gone through this crowd and are indicator, we will eventually potentially. Reach a stage like this. But these have cult followings. Yes, well, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a cult following. He, for whatever reason, decided to do actual science and wanted to crowd the campaign. Maybe he could do But I agree, rank and file scientists in academia, even the ones who are you know, well along in their, in their respective fields, um, you know, recognize they don't have anything close to this kind of model. So this is all theoretical for science, but I think it tells you something very real about the crowd mechanism if you have a base to and the social media to stoke the application. So this is to give you a sense of this kind of the circadian rhythms of the campaign. So this is video, this is data taken from the uh, website video, which is was hosting our uh, project video, so we can count the number of times a video was played. And this shows you these counts over the, the weeks of the campaign, and each of these is a day a day of the total. And in black here, I just show you the weekends so you can get a sense of what the, the kind of the, the rhythms are there. The weekends are really cool, usually troughs and these kinds of things, and that's just true of the internet people tend to go off the internet things with them on the weekends. <laughs> um, you can see that we had this spike on one of the days, and what, what was that about? With the spike actually larger than when we even launched. In fact, more views were seen on that one day than the first two days combined. This is when our video was first day, was first born on the internet. What drove that spike there? A site called Hacker News. Some people know this site, sort of like Reddit. If you've heard of Reddit, it's a site like Reddit. Where you Whole community of people can post links and then using these simple kind of up or down vote uh, uh, sort of quality control systems, they self police the content that's there. And there's also tends to be lots of really cool <coughs> content you know, in terms of the comments and now about trolls. So people go to these places and President Obama and get very fascinating and so called fascinating and everyone's doing a few days on Reddit. I can use a site like that. Some some person, supporter of our campaign, posted a link to our donation page and I went crazy that day. And so that ended up translating also to donations, but this is an example of organic traffic that we didn't plan, despite all of our efforts to solicit, you know, getting written about by science journalists, science writers, whatever. This was an example of some sort of organic um, and sustained by the community. So this post actually reached the front page, which is a big deal on these kind of uh, community comment sites. So now I want to talk about the, the, the numbers more in terms of sort of fundraising demographics here, so you can imagine there's you know, crowdfunding, the crowd is very diverse, uh, there's elements of the crowd that like, sort of fondly called beer demographic, that's giving you this lower range, $5 to $49, then there is this sort of mid-tier mid uh, 
um, Aaron Gombrange or the Champagne Diaper Act of 1509, and we have our angels here. And so if you ask what percentage of our $25,000 was contributed by these various different groups, and this was our, our coalition here. And if you look at these, these percentages expressed in terms of the total goal, so $25,000, this is the percentage of the total number of donors. We had around 390 donors. So you can see a small number of quote unquote angels contributed a huge chunk of the campaign. And we had this very large group of people who were giving essentially around the, they won't tell you, they were giving around the $25 median amount. Again, they were being driven by this, this guy right here. Um, they only were contributing about a fifth of the actual winning coalition. So this really was a coalition that depended on all three of these different segments. And I should say that uh, the question of whether this is representative of other crowdfunding sites, uh, these numbers, that at least this pattern here at the high end of this, 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 this skew here, where a small number of people give, give a sort of outsized amount, that tends to be a general feature. But in terms of these uh, spreads, for example, it really all depends on the purpose. Because generally, these campaigns have perks, and that can really drive things and what those price points, the most popular price points, can be, and the, sometimes reflecting what the, the perk is. So here is taking a look at our roughly 390 donors uh, uh, through this kind of a um, path. Are we considering them in our social network or sort of, uh, sort of close to our social networks? Uh, this is my social network uh, primarily, but also our Danny Karasicheski, he also was very involved in early this on his social media. Professor Daysolder was not so big on social media, so he didn't really bring in much traffic, but um, Danny also. Um, Essentially, was bringing in numbers. But if you think about this from my perspective, in terms of who's in my Facebook you network, my Twitter follower, this is what the donors spread out as. So there's a chunk of people who are followers of mine. Remember, Twitter is a is a, is a directed graph, so someone can follow me, but I don't necessarily follow them. Whereas Facebook, it, half by definition, is undirected, so both is mutual, right? Good friends with somebody, good friends with them, hopefully. Um, so you see, there's a chunk of people. Facebook, there's a smaller group of people who are on both networks and active, although their fund tends to be. Twitter dominant or Facebook dominant. And then there's a large number of people who are further away in the network. I don't know exactly where they are because they appear to be as strangers. Um, but so they, they, they could be not so far away, sort of friends of friend, but they could also be someone sort of perfect, you know, even all the way to Kevin Bacon. So I'm not sure if he did. So that, that gives you a sense of where these donors are coming from. We, in conjunction with NPR, who uh, Joe Palco wrote the story about us last month, um, talked about our campaign. We commissioned this sur a survey for the uh, 390 donors, and we had some traction that responded. Among many things we asked, we asked about where they're from. So most are coming from Anglophone countries. I think 67% are coming from North America, so US, Canada, and then England and then Australia, New Zealand. We had a group of people in the Southern Hemisphere who were really progeny for us. Uh, but they were also scattering from continental Europe, and then bits and pieces from South, South America. So it was actually quite a diverse coalition. We ask people, what do you do on the theory that, well, science crowdfunding, you know, we're just like these other crowdfunding you know, the very beginning, it's only the community supporting itself. So even in the beginning, maybe artists want to support artists, and people are really skeptical of whether this could scale because you would be non artists to support this. Um, so we asked, well, how many people, what do you do? And most of the people that responded, and presumably it's reflected of our uh, entire donor pool, was that about half of them identified, now self identified as a scientist of some kind. Now that, that includes both academic um, and industry, because some people refer to themselves, also as researchers, for example. And we had people who identified throughout the, throughout the ladder from, from undergraduates, from graduate students, to postdocs, uh, to professors. Um, but then we had uh, these two interesting other uh, categories, um, these other subgroups in our coalition. We had these people who are self identified as being in management. Um, so that's both for profit and, and non profit people would specify. And we had a chunk of people who reported that they were involved in IT or computing or something, or something of that sort. So it did seem to skew kind of techie in the end. 65% of all of them was actually men. Um, so it did skew a little bit uh, techie, I guess, and techie dudes. And that was reflected at Hacker News, showing you the video site. That was Hacker News as a site. Now, I don't know if I ever took the census of their site, but I see the profile text of video. Lots of dudes who are sitting there you know, just checking out what's going on the internet. Um, so they, and I talked to some people who did get it, they did that category, and they're awesome because without them, I don't think, I think they're actually a really cool, cool people to market to in terms of science uh, discovery because they don't themselves do science, but they are very science literate. And then we had a smattering of people from all these other professions, and then we had the cool 
cool sort of singletons two lawyers ascribe one full time mom, one part time with you, you need a hypnotherapist and an economist. <laughs> so now I want to talk about the network looking through a social, uh, I want to talk about the campaign looking through a social network prison. So I used a, a program that's open source called Gephi, G E P H I, um, which allows you to construct these kinds of toy networks. And then you can actually also get data from your real social networks as, as I did, and then work them to visualize what actually look like. So this is just a toy here, um, and the, what I want to demonstrate here is the, the graphs I'm about to show you, which are of my Facebook friends, about 700 of them at the time of the campaign, and then a similar graph for my Twitter followers, which is a little larger, around 1,000 people uh, at the time of the campaign. But the way I talk about, the way I visualize them is I, I break them down into what are called modularity classes, so distinct groups. So for example, I'll show you my Facebook uh, friends or family or friends, let's say, for different faces of my life. Um, and what I do is I scale the graph by, I scale each of these nodes, so these are nodes connected, these lines here are edges connected to other nodes. And I, the way I result, uh, visualize these graphs is I show, or I, I size the, the node by its degree. So the, the more connected node is, the larger it will be relative to the other node. So these orphans here are becoming the smallest because they all have more connection. So that's how I'm going to present the Facebook network. So here's my Facebook network. So, the take-home message is that 17% of my friends I was able to appeal to and had charity of person on me and eventually donated to the campaign. Usually quite enthusiastically as I find as I'm talking to them afterwards, uh, give them their feedback. Um, and you can see here that what I've done is now shown the, the Facebook net, my Facebook network in terms of these clusters. So these different colors respond, correspond to different phases of my life. So this is my graduate school. These are my graduate school friends. These are green and high post around. Uh, this is a cluster of people from Burning Man that I came from. Um, <laughs> school friends, family, and so on. And what I do on this graph here is it's the same exact layout, but now I just changed the color scheme to indicate who donated and who didn't donate. So in yellow here are all the donors, in blue are the non donors. So you can start to look for some patterns, maybe test some hypotheses about, huh, well, maybe it's only my science friends, that's where all the donors are coming from. Well, that's not true. You see actual, you see donors in sort of every cluster of my life. Um, so it, uh, there certainly was, so there was an average of 17% turnout. Now some of you were to look at the average according to some of these clusters here, it would change a little bit. And some, some gave it higher proportion than others, some were underrepresented. But generally, you saw people from all phases, essentially, not all people were willing to sort of fund me. Uh, we asked, for example, is there a connection between how much people gave and how big they are in my network, how, how connected they are. And there didn't seem to be any correlation at all. There were people who were sort of on the outskirts of the network in terms of they weren't really connected to many other people, but for whatever reason they gave a lot of money. And sometimes that had to do with their cash flow, and their profession, or whatever they do, um, and not so much whether or not they were, you know, how they were connected to me. But you can imagine asking yourself all kinds of questions. This is just the data set of one. Hopefully other people, as they crowd and are successful, uh, will do this kind of analysis and we can start to look for deeper patterns if they exist. But at least you should know that almost one in five of my Facebook Donating. So that was a five thousand dollar chunk without which we would have had a hard time reaching our goal. So you can look at the breakdown of some of these uh, social networks and I can tag them by what this is just friends of my wife, these are uh, people from grad school, people from postdoc, the Burning Man cluster. Um, and you can sort of see how they're uh, spread out. And other than seeing some interesting differences in the shape of the social network from my college friends to my grad school friends, um, there really wasn't that much of a difference. Although there seemed to be a case where um, you compare among these two different groups, the, the science friends in grad school versus the science friends in postdoc, there might have been a slight difference in sort of how connected the people were who ended up being donors. And then my grad school friends who were um, maybe a bit slightly more cliquish, and they and more, more my closer sort of mutual friend that ended up giving. Um, but again, there was nothing really obvious that was jumping out. So in the end, all I think is productive to talk about are just the percentages, give you a rough estimate. Now you can do the same kind of analysis with the uh, Twitter follower data. So this is help from a, a guy in 21st. This is his handle. Um, he basically got this data for me from Twitter. Um, and then with, I was able to visualize it in Gephi. So you can see again, uh, this is a directed graph. So I'm in a big circle here because everyone in this graph always goes by definition of follower of mine. And again, their size represents how connected they are within my following. So you can see that the, my Twitter, I tend to use Twitter really just mostly for science. So these clusters all break up into different uh, you know, science interests. So there's a farm up cluster, there's an open science enthusiast cluster, um, there's a science online cluster, uh, and there's a genomics cluster, and so on. 
you can do the same kind of comparison where you ask if the donors are in yellow, um, did any one subgroup actually care more than the other? It seems to be not the case. The distribution is pretty random across those networks. And again, there didn't seem to be any correlation with the size of the donation and how connected they were. And then you can imagine asking other kinds of questions on that network analysis person. I'd love to collaborate with anybody who is to look at this uh, in deeper detail. But again, the, again, the take home message was about 10% of my followers ended up donating. Again, at the time of the campaign, I had around 1,000. That will reinforce the idea that these crowdfunding campaigns are U shaped. You can look now and ask, when did the, my Twitter followers donate in the course of the campaign? This is just marking which day of the campaign it is, and it's just the time when, when they gave, or how many people gave, how many people on Twitter gave on that day. So, again, there was a number of followers and friends on the first day um, who donated, and they sort of again, otherwise, sort of just spread out uh, throughout the campaign. But there were some days where Facebook really wasn't doing anything. So it's, Seemed like actually in this midpoint here, I thought that I tapped out on Facebook. People were just tired of me talking about this project, probably if you did are hit me. Um, but in any case, it seemed that it kind of they you know, you hit your low point again in that middle. Because I think again, you get campaign fatigue, and everyone experiences that. Um, and you kind of flag a bit, and then you get, you get the surge at the end. It's probably an interesting observation. Um, isn't it day 28? It was that spike from the video? Oh, yeah. And there's like virtually nothing. Twitter and Facebook. It's true. I mean, I think in the end, um, it's a good observation because what, what this, I think the lesson would be is that you have to diversify your marketing strategies because there are going to be days when you know your social networks aren't going to do anything for you. And so you have to hustle and find someone else who's going to fill the gap so you keep that inexorable descent going to prepare you for that final you know, assault on the planet. So I now I think Kate Blogger, community manager uh, for Microwise, which is a Kickstarter of a science to science uh, project based on crowdfunding campaign. And it, part of my role for them is to is to do you know kind of Nate Silver style post game post campaign analysis on the science crowdfunding projects. So this is the same graph I showed you before. This is the crowdfunding discovery campaign. Now for some sense of comparison here, because I know we're all scientists and we don't want to take a sense of n equals one, we want to do some comparisons here. This is an example of a fifteen thousand dollar campaign. That ran on Microvisa, roughly the same window ours ran last fall. They were looking to uh, do simple drug screening assays, but they were looking for compounds that could kill the kill, test them more that affect humans. Essentially, it's a neglected health problem that is not addressed by the market. Worm control is actually not the profit condition that exists to address this, and this was a project, a specific project they were running to look for 15K. And you can see this is how their campaign progressed over time. What's interesting is that their campaign had many more of these sort of Years where actually there was zero donors giving zero dollars. They were going through these stretches here where nothing much was happening. And when they are transitioning between those periods of stasis, it's usually through kind of jumps. So in this campaign was 15,000 some odd dollars from around 90 people. And the truth was their campaign was mostly campaign fueled by angels. They didn't have a lot of press coverage. Um, it, it was some Bill Gates actually blogged about them, um, but they didn't know about it, so they weren't able to. Capitalize it and it didn't necessarily itself translate into anything. Although you would think maybe just because Bill Gates were talking about something, magic would suddenly happen. It was actually not. We found many other examples where someone who had a huge following or some huge influence who did something on social media who thought it was going to change the world and it didn't know when you heard it. So that's the one sort of double edged sort of about social media. But there can't, this angel, the one we're looking at was mostly driven by angels, people giving in large chunks, 500 here, a thousand there. And you interview some of those people, like, yeah, it turns out, not surprisingly, they're friends of the Essentially, who had disposable income and really believed in their the cause and believed in their friends to achieve that cause. So that's certainly a way you could, but there were, there were other people who were strangers to the work, but they were giving them more customary lower brain. So this is an example of raising money and essentially the, the RO3, which is a mechanism a lot of people talk about. People talk about the RO1 that the NIH uh, is having. The RO3 is a mechanism where you're raising in the $25,000 range. And I think crowdfunding is essentially at that stage, at least in science, where we, we can start to raise those kinds of sums that are um, not going to sustain a lab, but they're going to sustain, like the R 3 does, a specific project. But this is cool. This was at the 25K scale, essentially. Well, there have been actually crowdfunding campaigns in the sciences that have raised 10 times this amount. So in the fall, again, last fall was a really big, big time for, for you know, again, the transition from the prototyping phase of science crowdfunding to the actual stuff's happening. There was a campaign that was, two campaigns actually that were looking at 
uh, the lack of genetic sequencing the, the bacterial microbiomes that live in your body, sort of like 23andMe, but focused on the gut and the bacteria that live in your uh, bacteria that live in you know, live in your this is going to swab with the kid that they would send you, and you would then do this and stuff like that. They were these campaigns were asking for money, some ten times what we were asking. One of those is a project called the American Gut Project. So now you now you look at our campaign compared to the American Gut Project. This is a campaign that ended up raising three hundred and ten thousand dollars there. So they all had you know, their own sort of interesting genetics and dynamics where they would have these big chunks. These chunk, this chunk is actually caused by $10,000 chunk sort of um, solar like grants, but these were, these were basically people bundling money on behalf of, say, an organization, a disease app organization that was giving, say, 10 Ks to five kids for all of their members. So they were able to have really a number of different interesting ways to market their campaign um, and were the recipient of kind of sort of the events that were, were not going to happen on our scale, the 25 case scale, you know, these kinds of big matching events are not going to necessarily happen, but they're going to happen as you try to scale up to even higher and higher crowdfunding altitude. What so, did they offer? What so did American Gut offer? They offer you just like 23 and does. It's a, it's, a, it's a personal genomics company. They send you a kit which basically has a, you know, a sterile container and a Q tip, and you put around whatever. I will buy you one sample and then you send it back and then they presumably give you the sequence or they'll post it online and let you see it. Or not actually the two there's another campaign that did this as well that was America is an academic consortium because the other campaign was, was a sense of was a sense of a startup. So it's not clear exactly how this data is gonna flow, but presumably this this more academic project is gonna make this publicly available. So this is, this is directly public. Did you have to donate a certain amount of money to yes. get that? Yes, yeah. so their, their, their price point, for example, for the American Gun Project, their kit was selling one kit for 99 So their lowest price point was 99 So they were giving you a kit for your donation? Yes. And so that it was essentially an advanced sale. Okay. Um, you know, but again, this was, one of them was an academic, you know, sure. academic lab, so we're running the sequencing, and others are um, this is essentially a startup, so they can get with academic. Um, but yeah, they're essentially two, two, two kids for not $199, and so, and so on, and so on. And uh, American Gut was on Mycorrhiza, or? No, so American Gut was on uh, Indiegogo. Indiegogo, yeah. So yeah. And so our crowdfunding discovery project is now in progress. Um, and if you go to my website, pearlstreetlab.com, forward slash bag, forward slash crowd for discovery, it will generate this sort of set of content, which are, for example, blog posts that I did Respond to that Twitter analysis. Uh, a talk of me, a video of me giving this talk at an earlier point, a couple months ago. Uh, some of the actual, for example, in that network analysis, you can see the actual raw data here. Then for the science, the crowdfunding discovery science itself, the methamphetamine aspect, we've got, we've got posts and uh, uh, we're now in the process of doing uh, social media outreach on Google Plus and so on to actually bring people into, as we're starting to get results, bring people into the process sort of in real time. We're sharing all data, for example, we get on a site called BigShare, uh, which is an open data repository where you can have unlimited cloud storage space if you're willing to make your data, your unpublished data, uh, public. So we're using that resource as a way to also put all of our outputs on your job into the space. Does that interfere with um, your ability to publish this work? So we, are, we pitched this already uh, at the beginning as any, any publication resulting from this will be an open access. So we know on the record that. Um, you can cite objects, for example, research objects that are in Big Share on on journals like PLOS. So we also Peter J. Apple in the thousand and other other now there are certainly conventional publishing outlets or journal outlets which don't agree to this and right. consider lots of uh, any kind of pre pre embargo exposure or sharing of unpublished stuff can, can compromise the ability to be published. But we have written off those journals and we don't want to publish your So that's, that's the talk, and I'd be happy to take, uh, take questions. <laughs>
have a QR code reader on your installed on your phone, then you have to open that app, and then you have to go. I mean, it's like it's multiple not, steps. It's much cooler. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard for me to carefully control the experiment with him, but it did, I do know that the reason I produced them was I was going into conferences, or I had to make sure about the area and uh, a lot of perspective.
never going to be trivial like one click. But you know, writing writing grants, writing you know, going through the grant cycle, you know, at NIH, um, you know, we, we had uh, you know, the RO3 cycle at the exact timeline, but you know, I think we were able to raise that money much faster. Now we didn't have to go through the official peer review system, but we did get reviewed in some sense by by a crowd or we didn't ask anything on Reddit and that was open to a lot of actual good sexual questions and thought that was really productive. Um, we got lots of feedback on my blog and, and on Twitter about the project and about the merits. And so I uh, we feel like we had that process down for us. But think about the amount of time spent doing traditional fundraising, especially given the rejection rates so high, then you start to ask yourself, is this this is this seems like a lot of work? Yeah, it's a lot of work if you're doing it for the first time, like taking a half stop for the first time. I'm sure once you did the YC, you sort of would get better. Uh, but that gets to the second question obviously someone's asked is how do you make this sustainable? And so there's other ways to slightly different discussion. Mark. I'm interested why people give money specifically. Do they get any way to end of the project? Is it gonna is there a report or something? So basically what I'm showing you from this is a snap, a screenshot from my website, which is what we're, what we're giving people is a data trail. So we're posting as results trickle and we're putting them on the site called FigShare where anybody can download. We're producing sort of uh, you know, updates as we go along that come out in blog form, for example, that are sent out to an email list to have all the donors, but also simply posted on my site for anyone to see. Um, obviously, for the campaign itself, we have a perfect, but the, in terms of the actual, once the project, you know, now that the project is unfolding, the reward is that is what we call a thrill of discovery. It really is that we're going to put ourselves out there, for example, with, with results that they trickle in and get, and get feedback from people. We're sort of open 24, not literally 24 7, but we're open for feedback. In a way that if you look at the way most biomedical basic research labs run, they're not sort of transparent and open in that way. The only time you ever see what they do is if you, if you happen to you know, have enough money to go to one of the conferences and get invited to hear actual scientific talks talked about, or you wait until it's published, in which case you don't have institutional access, you have to pay $31 to download a PDF. Usually English is unintelligible to most people outside of even the specific field that we're talking about. So we are taking a different approach where we're just sharing the content of the actual results, and that is the product. Can you make the video at the end? It's work to, to, to go through and look at data. That's work. Absolutely. We, we are, we're definitely thinking of, um, of having sort of a, once, especially once the project is done, we're thinking of having kind of a video as a symmetry to close out the whole project. But during the process, we're going to be doing uh, things like Google Plus Hangouts, where we could record conversations with experts, presumably, you know, uh, in pharmacology, or even non-scientists you know, who are not experts in that field, and then we're getting feedback from other groups, and then recording these sort of interaction sessions and putting them as part of our content stream here. So it's basically going to get a content chronicle of the project in this multimedia form. And that, that is the product. Yeah. Uh, just quick comment on following on that. I think the interesting thing is that traditional for Kickstarter pro, uh, projects, the most successful ones are like movies or like electronics because of the reason you mentioned. You get like, it's advanced marketing, you buy a product essentially. So you're giving money so that you can see that movie eventually or you know, you're getting a product for it. It's interesting, I love what you thought about you're offering people the thrill of the experience of discovery. And so one of the things to sort of monitor is how that changes our approach to open science and makes you more transparent with your money on that. And how what appetite there is for that for the public. So it's an interesting sort of um, a sort of a key player in the idea of open science going forward. Um, the question that I sort of wanted to ask is replicability as in how do we encourage more scientists to do this? Because what you did was anyone who has done a campaign before knows the emotional turmoil of yourself when you go through the campaign. And you need all these skill sets, right? Which scientists don't have. You know, you had the logo, you had QR codes, you had a project video, you have to do social media well. And these are things that scientists who are busy in the lab don't necessarily do ordinarily. So do like in terms of putting a kit together or a manual for how people take this on, what does that look like? And you think that there needs to be an education process that is within the institutional system, as in this goes side by side with what we learn in undergrad or whatever, or do you think it's a generational thing where naturally more people are on social media and the next generation will work out? I think it's going to be younger academics um, look, seeking out their local administrators, either grant offices or the advanced offices, the publicity, basically publicity on the university. It's going to be younger scientists, maybe a few brave sort of 
your tenure. Well, the ones who are near tenure are getting money. They've they got a lot of things that they've done. The post tenure is possible, but those, I think, a lot of ways, these are completely orthogonal skills to what you know, that individual used to get to where they are. So I think it's going to be younger scientists, obviously, um, who are going to be you know, more amenable to um, you know, these new things. They're going to partner with uh, the local administrative university who are hopefully going to be lower than the matter. Although I'm sure there'll be some universities and boarding students that are going to be much more kind of, whoa, you know, this is all something scary. And, but there's going to be plenty that are more forward thinking. And I think actually what's going to really make the difference between the two is that if you get a really charismatic young passionate scientist, you know, speaking their hearts to their local administrators who are just kind of by default putting on the brakes on anything new, that could actually result in something that can be forward. But I think it's going to be. You're going to see crowdfunding first in this ROI type of domain, where it's going to be in the kind of 25K range, where you can imagine, okay, this is something where you could even imagine factoring in the salary for an individual for their salary, but only on, you know, for a couple of months, let's say, not for an entire year. But I think if you're kind of willing to start small, if you're willing to take on these kind of quarterly projects or these seed projects or these kind of self contained projects, I think that's where you're going to see the most success. But there's always going to be that food of the person or food of project and just the right confluence of circumstances where they want to do something really big and it's like they want to want like someone's just going to tap a nerve, you know, if you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson like, tweets about your campaign is hardcore on it and like that could make it blow up and it'll be like the dollar rainbow. So we don't have those kinds of blues, but I think more consistently we'll have young scientists getting to say if the green light on their level of constitution and working on projects that I think, you know, um, they're, they're going to I think young scientists are going to have a more innate understanding of how to communicate this to other people. Just because being on social media, if they ever talk about the science, they're forced out of their job and forced out of their kind of mental siloed mentality. And, and that just naturally starts to develop, they start to develop a communication muscle and then they get better. And, well, yeah, certainly there are going to be people who this is going to be an asthma to, I guarantee it. In fact, you're going to say, we already do crowdfunding, it's called taxation. And then, like, <laughs> and say, well, look how our Congress is working out for you. How's that suggest they're working out? So I think it's time to sort of adapt new ways, but we have to start small. Yeah. So um, this kind of goes in line with what the American Gut Project is doing. Uh, how do you feel about not only maybe gathering funds, but also gathering data throughout Kickstarter? You know, because um, it seemed like you know they had a huge amount of donors and they got all these you know, microbiome sequences, which they can probably use. You know, their big um, data to have experiments for. Um, you know, different publications, or you mentioned that they had a, uh, like a company associated with them, so like some sort of analytics. So you're asking for you're specifically to do what with the data? Like, so, all the, so like, like sequencing data. Yeah, yeah. If, for an example, like gathering data alongside money. Um, you know, um, like what the Personal Genome Project does, but you know, through Kickstarter form. Get no, I, I think it's a good model. If you're asking is it a good, clever, good model? I think it is. I think that part of the success of my project projects is that there was this movement called the quantified cell movement, which, you know, it was initially like only the domain of Steve Jobs is the extraordinary rich people who were tragically sick and who were pushing the balance to like get them cell sequencer to do it. Now it's becoming more, especially the price of sequencing, will eventually be a thousand dollar genome. It's always going to cost more to analyze it. Yeah, but we are getting closer and closer and closer to that point. And that is, that is inspiring this quantified cell movement of people who are like, I'm going to download an app where I have I just have an app where you can tell your resting heart rate looking at the, the flush response. Now just imagine as more and more citizen scientists are essentially becoming interested in biology, they're going to start calling themselves quantified scientists. So that's the movement. And I, I personally think that that was part of what drove the success of those kind of And I see more of those coming online, in which case it becomes a natural partnership between fundraising and data generation. But obviously you have to, you know, obviously anything to do with sequencing of the genome of humans has to be put through, it has to be informed, it has to have informed consent, and they yeah. have to sort of abide by those, those, those sort of ethical standards. But I think as long as there might be some controversy in terms of people being more willing to be exhibitionists than other people who are maybe slightly more paternalistic and saying, don't, don't do that. But I think that's natural. It's going to play out and we'll see what happens. But it's a good model. Yeah. Why did you use Twitter? Because the message like yeah, it really forces you to come up with taglines. And this is where maybe this is anathema to a lot of academics who maybe tend toward verbosity, but you have to be a little bit more concise. 
And so it also forces you to try out many messages. But that's actually the good thing about it, is because you don't have to waste a lot of resources on coming up with a 100 page character statement, you could turn through a lot of them and test them out and willing to get rid of things that you thought were really clever, but no one responded to, and then find out the messages that, for example, work. So that the, the, the brevity of Twitter is actually its asset in terms of how vulnerable your messaging can be. You ever use a Twitter message to refer people to a website or something that can give a full presentation? Yeah, so there's, there's basically two ways you can use Twitter. You can, you can use the megaphone function, which is just shout out messages. So, hey, I'm proud of funding a meth lab. Check me out, though, and this is where I can put that, that's really that comfort as well. The, that's one form of tweeting where you're just using the megaphone. But there's also a form of tweeting where it's sort of like you're sending a private, you're sending a private message because you can tweet at people, right? If the tweet starts with at blah, 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 it's essentially like sending in a 140 character email. Although it can be seen by all of your mutual followers, so it's like a sort of semi-private email. And that way, we did that where we sent a link to the project page to, you know, we did that to tons of people. We were basically cold call them, but as a, as a tweet. And some of those ended up translating. Like I said, we had two five hundred dollars orders we gave in response to a tweet. So that was the case of hundred characters yielding five hundred dollars. That was the most efficient character that I could get with some of those tweets. Um, so again, if you're on the more you're on Twitter, the more you can kind of play with it and figure out other ways, more creative ways to use it. But those are the two basic ways: micro targeting and also just the human mind. And what portion of your solicitation was uh, print letter? As opposed to electronic. Yeah, the only printed story. item we gave were those business cards with the, the code on it, which I think were useless. But also, I gave out business cards with my own info. So, if people subsequently did a Google search, which then took them to the page, I, I, I couldn't figure that out. Yeah. But we did, the only physical items we gave out were essentially just links to the page, as business cards, or just referrals to ourselves in our own content. Okay, so I think um, that's the end of the questions. Ethan, thank you very much for coming. And thank you all for coming as well. Please take a doggy bag. <laughs>